Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here. I'll be brief today before answering your questions. As we head into next week's veto session, I want to once again make clear the significant concerns I have with the direction we appear to be heading. Again and again, Vermonters have been vocal about the affordability of our state, whether it's our ranking as one of the highest tax states in the country, the cost of housing, property taxes, home heating bills, and more. Too many Vermonters are struggling to get by and are faced with the tough reality that they may not be able to afford to stay in the state they love for much longer. Anecdotally, we hear of people who have considered moving to Vermont, which would help our economy, but have second thoughts after seeing how expensive it is and the severe lack of housing for the middle class in particular. So while we've made progress over the past six years, we have to stay focused on affordability. And while the legislature rejected most of my proposals to give Vermonters the tax relief they deserve, we have been successful in preventing increases in taxes and fees, which has allowed us to be more competitive with surrounding states. But this year, I'm worried the legislature is reversing the clock, undoing a lot of the good work of the past six years, and setting us up for failure. Whether it's a $100 million payroll tax, $20 million in unnecessary DMV fee increases, hundreds of millions in additional costs that will come with the clean heat standard, spending 70 million more than I propose in base spending, and more. When I'm outside the Montpelier bubble, <clears throat> I hear a lot of the spending in Montpelier is out of control, and they're wondering how they'll be able to afford it. To be clear, I think all Vermonters are taxed too much, and the last thing we should be doing is raising them, given high inflation and record surpluses. But what concerns me most about the approach the legislature has taken this year is that those who can least afford it will feel the financial harm the most. Those lower on the economic ladder, struggling to get by, who already qualify for free childcare or free school meals, will now be forced to pay more to help families making $170,000 a year get childcare subsidies or free lunch for their kids. That's not progressive anything but, and it doesn't feel right. I've said it dozens of times, and I'll say it again. I share many priorities with the legislature. We want to invest in many of the same things, but we can't do it all at once and make it less affordable in Vermont than it already is. When voters went to the ballot box this year, many made the choice to split their ticket, voting for a Republican for governor and a Democrat as their legislators. But I don't believe they did so, expecting one side could completely ignore the other. They want us to work together, to at least negotiate so we get some balance. That matters to me, and it's why I tried to meet the legislature where they were right out of the gate in January. And that's the case today as well. I'm still ready to work with them. And I'll now open it up to questions. Um, I know that you haven't, or you probably haven't already met with um, the speaker and the pro tem to talk about uh, their new ideas regarding the motel program. I understand you're meeting tomorrow, but um, have you? and I received any additional information, do you have any thoughts to share about it at this point? I don't have much to share with you. I haven't seen their proposal at this point. Uh, you may know more about it than I do, um, but um, we're expecting to get something possibly this afternoon or tonight to review before the meeting tomorrow. One of the ideas for funding GA housing to some extent potentially could involve pulling down future federal infrastructure funds, this match that we talked about earlier this session, it would, that wouldn't open up the budget, but would you be in favor or in theory be, um, be opposed to that? I'd be opposed to that, yeah. That was uh, one of the things that I thought was important. I still believe it's important, um, given the, the economic storm clouds that I keep talking about. 
uh, we, we're going to need that match money uh, in order to keep some of these projects moving forward to help our economy continue to move forward if we go into a downturn. So I think it's vitally important that we have the match uh, to be able to do that to help the very people we're trying to, uh, to assist with. Um, I also think, though, that there is room within the budget to work things around uh, to make things work uh, in, for, in both our um, favors. So we'll see what they have to offer, um, but, um, but I'm re ready uh, to, uh, to at least hear them out. Are there issues that have arisen um, in the weeks since the legislature adjourned that you think a companion bill drafted it right now might be useful in addressing? Oh, sure. Yeah. I think uh, some of the, there's been a lot of housing money that's been put forth to VCB, for instance. Um, they, uh, they didn't fund some of our requests in terms of uh, the VHIP program, which I think is so essential. I think that would help uh, in terms of the homeless population as well uh, and those who can't find housing. I also uh, believe uh, that we need to, they didn't uh, decide to move forward on the uh, stabilization reserve fund uh, for landlords uh, that I think would be really helpful uh, because there are many, as we found um, after uh, trying to, um, to, uh, to go in and survey uh, some of those in the, in the hotel motel programs at this point in time, many of them have Section 8 vouchers. And we're finding uh, throughout the state that there are many landlords who uh, don't necessarily want to rent uh, to those folks because, uh, let's be honest, there is some damage that comes along with it, and some, not in all cases, but in some cases. Uh, and the landlords are left uh, holding, uh, holding the bag, so to speak, uh, with a lot of repairs uh, that they can't afford. Uh, so this, this capital reserve would help if someone uh, did some damage. Uh, they could uh, put those, uh, use this fund uh, to put their, their units back online, uh, as well as if they weren't paid uh, for uh, rent and so forth. So that's something. BHB received an enormous amount of money, and whether that was redirected in some way, I think that would be helpful. Um, I've talked to a lot of service providers who were surprised to learn that, according to them, based on correspondence that they got from Commissioner Winters that um, the majority of the thousand or so households that um, had originally been set to lose eligibility on July 1st will in fact um, be able to stay an additional 84 days based on this new guidance. And I'm wondering if you can talk about um, the, the, that universe of people, how many of them are going to be able to stay until September? based on what's come out now. Yeah, I think I'll have to rely on Secretary Samuelson on this. I wonder if, Jason, it's just kind of easier to see. We can put up the slide. So as folks may remember, if we go back, um, to uh, a few press conferences ago, and even the last one, we talked about restarting the general assistance housing program on the first of yeah, on on the first of uh, July. The general assistance housing program has several different eligibility criteria. One of them are for vulnerable populations; those individuals that we've discussed before are pregnant. Um, who uh, individuals with a disability, families with young children, um, those over the age of 65. They're, when we restart the program, they're extended by 28 days. But there are other families who are, con who are in the what are considered catastrophic, which we also talked about the last, the last time that we were here, and they're eligible for 84 days. When we look at the data, it breaks down so that right now we have 1,200 households that are in the program. Of those 1,200 households, 524 of them qualify for 28 days, and 636 qualify um, for 84 days. Now, if you have a catastrophic event, that tr that autumn, that trumps your vulnerable population. So there's there are individuals who may be families with children in that 84 days, or individuals who are older than 65. Um, 
the service providers that I've talked to say they reviewed the catastrophic, mm -hmm. the, what's, what's required to uh, be eligible for the catastrophic, mm -hmm. um, and they're saying the people, these numbers do not match with the situations that they're hearing. These people, in fact, would not qualify based on the very um, narrow eligibility yeah. guidelines. I, I can only leave that to the Department for um, Children and Families rather than the service providers who are the ones who determine eligibility. Um, and these are, the, these are the numbers that they have from doing eligibility determination um, with individuals. So, um, Actually, since can I piggyback on that? Yeah. I've talked at, at length with the department mm -hmm. about these numbers, and I've heard the same. Um, I mean, the exact quote I got from one service provider is these numbers don't make sense. Mm -hmm. um, and the catastrophic is not, my understanding, based on conversations with your department, is not actually based on individual determinations about what people qualify for. It's projections based on pre-pandemic numbers. Based on the actual numbers that you have about like mm -hmm. how people are qualifying, you're looking at less than 100 qualifying for catastrophic. So yeah. why did you so, use pre-pandemic projections instead of like documentation that you actually currently have for that population? So the way that the program is currently designed um, individuals who like we are restarting the program and redetermining eligibility in those catastrophic categories every month um, and so on on July 1st when the program restarts because remember we are currently in the pandemic housing program different eligibility criteria wide open um, they will determine the eligibility at that point in time again the Department for Children and Families are the individuals who determine eligibility they are very skilled at it, um, and the, the numbers that we have here really reflect their knowledge, their experience, and their interactions with the current clients. So these numbers right here are a projection based on what you think you're going to hear from motel guests when you conduct the actual eligibility interviews on July 1. These numbers here reflect what, what DCF has for information related to eligibility as of now. Every single month, they redetermine eligibility for individuals. On, on July 1, they start actually two weeks before that, we will, we will know exactly who falls into which category person by person. I mean, what you're saying is directly contradicting what I've heard from DCF. Like, within like, we were talking about this a week ago. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe you're like, the website itself said, like there's an asterisk and it says like, it's based an, on pre-pandemic projections. Yeah, it's based on, it is based on projection. Again, eligibility is, I don't think it's in conflict. Eligibility is determined on a month by month basis. We, during the pandemic, we did not use the same eligibility criteria. Um, we are restarting the GA program on July 1st and on July 1, individuals will be determined for eligibility. Again, Department for Children and Families are the ones who determine eligibility, and they're the, they are the ones who have the expertise in, in determining um, and projecting out what our estimates are gonna be going forward. So are these estimates based on pre-pandemic data about the population that was eligible then, or are these estimates based on current knowledge of the population that's in hotels right now? It's a combination. And again, eligibility, we don't have the, elig the actual, the eligibility will be determined for the GA program on July 1st. Um, this is a significant number of folks staying in motels and hotels for a significant amount of time. Mm -hmm. Um, presumably, I mean, Governor, you talked about the scale of expense associated with this. Is this an unforeseen draw on general fund dollars? And if so, how are you accommodating that? Well, again, um, I, I do believe um, this will have an impact on the general fund. Um, and we're going to, um, we can get through it uh, at this point in time. And that's why it's so important that we put all the tools uh, in the toolbox so that we can provide for uh, permanent housing uh, in the long run, whether it's the VHIP program or some of the landlord assistance uh, programs and so forth, uh, so we can open up 
as many units as, pro uh, as possible. Uh, we've also uh, directed, as I put in the um, executive order, had the Department of Public Safety actually go out uh, in some of these the higher um, populated centers that are impacted the most, like Rutland, um, Barrie, and uh, and uh, others, maybe maybe Bennington. I can't remember, uh, but um, but to actually survey to find out what's open, like what what have we had for violations? What are closed down at this point in time, um, so that we can put them back online. So. But yes, this will have an impact on the general fund. When, when did you find out that more than half of the households that were originally set to be exited on July 1st were in fact going to be able to stay until for, for an additional three months? Yeah, um, well, some of that um, I will take uh, partial blame for um, because I had always assumed uh, that the numbers we were receiving uh, were included uh, those with, with kids, for instance, uh, that would be still eligible for the program. That was not the case. Um, I think it was communicated uh, maybe uh, differently uh, in, in throughout our process and, and not knowing everyone that was going to be involved. Um, I, I just assumed uh, that we would be able to take care of the most vulnerable. And so um, I said that we should follow through on that. So are you saying that you've made a decision as an executive that households with children will qualify for this extra 84 days? Yeah, I mean, well, it, no, it wasn't for the 84 days. It was for uh, the extra 20, 20 days, right. Yeah. Yeah. You want to come up and clear this up? But it was for the for the first piece. Yeah. That was the part that I was involved in. Yeah, and I think I, I, there's a nuance here, right? When we talked about the program, from the beginning, we've talked about restarting the general assistance housing program on July 1st. I think what's, what we're hearing here is a, a, as folks learn more about the in-depth of that program, not, not the governor, not I, but folks on the ground, there's a realization what that means is that the eligibility criteria pre-pandemic and now is, has nuance to it. It's 28 days for vulnerable populations and 84 days for catastrophic. That's nothing new. Um, and so when we made the decision to reset the program, um, that's, that was the decision that, that we made as a team. And, 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 there are, and there are individuals with families that are in that catastrophic family and vulnerable in, individuals. And so if, you, if you're right now projecting, and so I'm assuming budgeting for 636 households, getting the 84 extra days of eligibility. If you encounter situations where you think this is a family that needs the additional days but they don't quite qualify under catastrophic, but can you make a, can you make a decision at that stage? So I think our goal all along has been to really work with folks to get into permanent housing. Um, and that's what we're actively working with families and families with children on as we, as we move forward. Um, and I think that, that, that's where, um, you know, we're working really closely with the, the local cities and towns. Um, we're working lo closely with local service providers to ensure that individuals have the services they need to make the transition to permanent housing, because that's in the best interest of families and children. Um, I have a questions. Um, I put in a request for the, um, RFP proposals that were submitted and also the letters of interest that were submitted um, from, you know, nonprofits, municipalities, companies um, responding to the state's calls for shelter proposals. Um, I was told the RFP was a sealed bid process, so they won't be released. The only thing that will be released is the actual, whatever contract is awarded. Um, and the names of anyone who is submitted, but not any additional details. And when it comes to the letters of interest, which were submitted to DCF from partners on the ground, I was told that those are also not exempt, uh, sorry, that those are not subject to public disclosure. Um, why not release these proposals? Um, why keep them under wraps? Secretary Samuelson. 
So well, it's the first time I've heard of heard of your request, so I'll go back and can get you more information. Um, I do know that what we're working towards with the RFP is to follow the standard contracting processes that we do in the state. We've just started reviewing um, those bids at this point and haven't made an award. Um, and so it is our usual practice to go through that bid process and then make announcements. I, I can follow up with you offline. But I guess why make the decision to release this as a sealed bid as opposed to one where everything is released publicly? Yeah. I have to follow up, I'll follow up with you um, offline again. We'll need to work with our um, staff to better understand. Okay. What about the letters of interest? Um, that's separate, technically. Um, mm -hmm. Those are, I'm also being told that those are exempt from public dis Closure yeah, and I can read and to you the exemption that's yeah, provided. Yeah, un unfortunately, I don't think that Commissioner Winters is able to be on um, today. I mean, some other other family issues going on, and so we'll get back to you after. Okay. Well, I'd like to hear from the governor. I mean, do you think, in principle, that these proposals should be public, given the amendment? I think interest? when it's appropriate, I think they should be public. Yes, um, but in in my years of contracting. Uh, not everything was released uh, at the time they got into the office. There was a bid date. Uh, it was a sealed bid until then. And if there was any nuances within or any flexibility within um, the bid itself, they weren't released until um, they got through all that uh, to make sure that they compared apples to apples. So I, I can understand part of this, um, but eventually I, they should be all public. I guess, I mean, the letters of interest weren't really bids. It was a pretty, it seemed like a pretty informal process. Um, I mean, do you think those should be not released for the time being? Well, again, I don't know what they came back with. I don't know what they say. I don't know if they made um, contentions within the letters. I just don't know that much about them. I haven't seen them. So I, I, I don't think I should comment until I know a little bit more about that. Um, but I do believe in transparency. Relatedly, um, you know, I've, I've heard some grumbling from service providers saying, A, you know, we weren't given a lot of time to submit these, and now it's been two weeks and we haven't heard anything back, including how much money is really on the table, when we're going to know what they're going to award. Um, and, you know, we're, I mean, a lot of folks already left um, the hotel. So, um, yeah, I mean, do you feel like state government is moving fast enough here? I think we're moving at an appropriate pace, yes. Uh, Governor, uh, Rutland City, and I, I apologize if the question's been asked, I'm sorry I'm late. Rutland City has a written emergency housing transition plan that includes busing people elsewhere. Are you aware of that? And if so, uh, do you know where, whether they will be busing them out of state or just inside Vermont? Yeah, I don't. I don't know anything about that. Um, this is the first, I've heard of that proposal. I know that there was um, some event we had. I believe we had all kinds of um, providers and so forth coming together in, in Rutland, in particular, to see what we could do to solve this problem. And I don't know if that was yesterday, or the day before. I, ju I just don't remember. But I remember reading about it. Maybe it was last week. It's this week, I'm not sure which it's this week. Okay. Well, there's a, an event uh, that Rutland is putting on themselves um, to, to try and help out. Now, there, if you, you can see the numbers, I mean, that's, yeah. it hit me um, when, uh, when you see uh, the, the gross numbers of like Rutland district office, um, proportionally uh, per capita, uh, they are the highest or the most impacted. Uh, and, then from there, I would say maybe even the Barry office and uh, Bennington, Brattleboro, and, and, and Burlington per capita, the district office is doing um, much better than the others. So those are the areas that we're, we're focused on, and I, I know Rutland in particular um, has had to, to deal with this uh, throughout the pandemic. Can you give us a ballpark um, estimated cost for the extended eligibility for the, you know, the 524 households that are getting the extra month and the 636 are getting the extra three months. Yeah, I, I don't have that. Yeah. Um, Ballpark. I 
don't want to bump this bump parking for you. Um, why don't I, we'll get you the table afterwards. All right. I mean, you seemed like you were telling us exactly how much it was costing per month to do this, these hotel stays. Um, I've been doing it for three years. Yeah, we should be able to. <laughs> well, so I guess that's <laughs> no. what I. It, it, exactly. yeah, we haven't so done it yet. It was, so. it was less than the cost of a month. So, it, the, uh, the extension of the program. So. And why was that? Because of renegotiated uh, hotel rates? Why would it be less than a month if there's such a substantial number of people staying for four months? Three months and then. I'm not going to do. I'm concerned about doing math from the podium. I want to make sure that you get the actual right numbers. So we'll get you, get you those numbers afterwards. Part of it is that there's a number of households that have transitioned out of the program already, and there are a number of households who will continue to transition out of the program. But why don't we'll get you the numbers afterwards? Senator Baruch said uh, we'll be housing people until there's an alternate stable system in place. Will you be vetoing any budget that includes essentially open-ended funding? Well, I'd like to see what they're proposing first. I, I have no idea what they're, what they're going to be putting, putting forward. So I think I would, um, I think I'll wait until I read their proposal, meet with them, so I fully understand what they're contemplating. So yesterday, um, you let the Universal School Meals bill go through without your signature saying you feel like there, in reality, have been an overridden um, in the veto session. I guess why that train or that thought process for this bill, not other ones say it's child care that also has overwhelming legislative support? Yeah, it's a difficult one uh, to communicate in some respects. And, uh, and I do think that we have a lot of work to do in education. Uh, I saw some further numbers uh, yesterday where um, there was a study done by some group and uh, math scores are down uh, dramatically, um, reading scores are down dramatically over the last two years. Uh, we have a lot of work to do there. Um, so again, I didn't want to uh, come to a point where we're just, um, this gets politicized in a way where uh, we don't focus on those fundamentals that I think are so essential. Um, but I. As I said right from the beginning, uh, you know, we, I truly believe uh, that we should help those families and those kids. They need our help. Um, but I, I fundamentally uh, don't believe that those um, that are impacted, those on the lower end of the scale, uh, should be paying for more affluent families for a free lunch. Uh, I think they can pay their fair share, and they're willing to. So it just seems counterintuitive to me. The other thing that was somewhat counterintuitive, and I know we've been talking a lot about independent schools and so forth, but the class um, that was left out uh, are those um, independent schools that don't take um, public money. And uh, so it appears we don't care as much about the children in those situations as we do in public, um, public schools, which leads me to believe it's more about politics than policy. Uh, you mentioned transparency. What do you think of the legislature impeachment committee, inquiry committee, meeting behind closed doors? Yeah, I mean, this is, this is their prerogative. Uh, they're in control. I'll let the legislative branch take care of that. But um, I, I understand the sensitivity. Um, but, um, but that's something they'll have to answer to. And I actually do have one serious question left. It is a serious question. That wasn't a serious question? No, th this one is. Oh. I'm just getting you ready for it. Uh, <laughs> do, you, do you plan to enjoy Father's Day maple creamy? And if so, will you be using BT Digger's creamy locator? Yeah. Um, I, uh, I enjoy maple creamies. Uh, that wasn't on my, my list of things to do uh, for Sunday. We'll have to see what happens. But that's usually my day of mowing. So I don't know if I'll have time for creamy. We'll go to the phones before coming back to the room. I think uh, Ed Barber, Newport Daily Express. All right, we'll go to Tom Davis, Compass, Vermont. 
Mike Jason, Guy, we're reading about the uh, potential of beta technologies getting involved with the Northeast Kingdom Airport. Um, are you aware in those conversations that there'll be opportunities for both uh, other private aircraft and also some state uses for that airport in conjunction with beta, or would they take it over completely as a private airport? Well, it'd be a somewhat of a combination of the two, and we'll put that out, and, and it wouldn't just this is something that we'll put out to anyone, and then we'll uh, we'll get bids back and so forth. But some of the criteria would be that it has to be uh, kept open uh, to the general public, and also the leases uh, that are on the property at this point in time would be honored. So it'll be a little bit of a combination of the two. Are you in favor of uh, this if, if all the numbers work out? Yes. Yeah, I think uh, I think this would be great news um, if it was beta, and we'll see who else um, comes forward. But if it was beta, I believe there would be uh, significant for the region from an economic standpoint, and uh, would really have a, a ripple effect uh, across the whole Northeast Kingdom. So I think this is great news if it comes to uh, fruition. Very good. No other questions. Thank you. Thank you. on the line, so we'll go back to here. Governor, outside of your ceremonial office, um, you now have a, their DGS just put in a brand new battery pack housing for those those batteries that were in the basement of the state house insurance company put the kibosh on that. So they're now in the parking lot. Have you gotten a chance to, to look at those yet? I have not, um, but, uh, but I just want to correct you. That's my state house office. It's not the ceremonial. We actually use that. So. Right, your office. <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you think this, the added cost of having to bring those outside, set up a, a, a housing for them, wire yeah. it into the state house, is, is that an added cost, do you think, that we as a society should be taking a look at? Or I, I, th I think it's twofold. I think it's, it's, it's something I do believe in. I think having uh, a battery, a uh, large-scale battery storage, I think is part of the solution both large scale and small scale is part of the solution for the future to make um, some, some of our renewables make sense. Um, it's unfortunate that we didn't, weren't able to catch this before it happened, uh, that it was actually installed in the basement before uh, the insurance company weighed in and said, um, no, you can't have it there. So that didn't come out until after we had it in place. So that is unfortunate. But, but I do, I do think this is the, this is what we need to do. Uh, we're going to need to be able to, um, to have uh, that backup battery, um, as well as to uh, soften the demand uh, cycles and so forth, uh, so that we can utilize that to our full advantage. So, it's the future and it's coming, and we should be part of it. Should other institutions, schools? Yes. colleges, even homes be yep. thinking about this type of Well, they of do. I mean, when you think about um, some of the, the smaller scale uh, battery backup, so to speak, uh, Tesla has one, Remount Power is involved in that. You can either buy it or rent from them, I believe. Uh, but there's other uh, private entities that sell them. So uh, yeah, I, I think that that's, uh, that's going to be helpful in the future. You can go, um, um, in some cases, days uh, without power, especially with what we're seeing with climate change and so forth, um, it's, it's nice to have, uh, instead of a generator, you have a, a battery backup. Any suggestions? You have a question? I have lots of questions. But, um, to go back to your question about the cost of it, and I apologize, I, again, didn't want to do the inappropriate math um, while I was here at the podium. The total cost of restarting the program and extending it to families with children up to 18 um, is on the low end $7.2 million, and on the higher end, depending on how many individuals go into the catastrophic category, $10 million. Our goal is really to work, um, and the, the Department of um, Finance and Management has been working hard to find that, um, that funding, and has been able to do that without needing to reopen the budget conversation. Seven to ten per month. No, for the for the full um, extension of the program through the eighty-four days. How can that be? Because 
weren't you, didn't you say governor it was 18 to 20 million dollars a month to run it as what as it had been running when we had 3,000 when you had, had 1,800 households that numbers wrong it was it in was, October that was a reference to October yeah, I mean, there was one number where the it was like 20 million, but that's oh, yeah. because they gave out the right. deposits. It was, Actually, it was down in half, I think, right? Yeah, the the real monthly number is seven to eight. Mm -hmm. So that, but if the monthly number is seven to eight, and you've got. So I'm happy to have okay, someone yeah, we don't need because to work what we don't want to yeah. I think we don't want to work out the details here, um, but that when they when they looked at it, depending on the range of whether an individual. Um, and or if a household falls into catastrophic or a vulnerable population um, is 7.2 to 10 million dollars. All right, thank you. Yeah, um, not to beat this to death, but um, I just went back to you know my emails to look at my correspondence with uh, the folks at DCF about this, and I was asking about the data and why it was this, and it said prior to the pandemic, the split between catastrophic and vulnerable was 55 and 45%. MESD expects similar utilization in July of 2023. Uh, you know, many households qualify for both, with GA eligibility returning to specific day counts. ESD anticipates that these households will provide further documentation to qualify for 84 days. So it seems pretty clear that they're saying this is entirely based on pre-pandemic projections and that's also what it says on your own website where it says the number of households are a projection based on pre-pandemic eligibility as i said it's based on uh, based on the information they have in determining eligibility and on their experience on the ground right now um, so they're they're using the best estimates to count to calculate this out but they're saying this is based on pre, not well, how they're saying now. Happy to take it with you offline. Um, Are you taking new applicants for, for this program? It's an ongoing program, so okay. yes. So someone, for example, moves from another state here and says, I, I'd let, I don't have a home, and they really don't. Uh, they're they would be eligible to be if they met the, the qualifications that we had before pre-pandemic they would be eligible today okay or july 1 i should say sorry one more question uh you mentioned you follow up about the rfp and the um letters of interest letters of interest thank you um will that be today i was planning on doing a story today in terms of when those will when those will be released, just you said there'd be additional information. So kind of, we'll, we'll, follow we'll follow up with you today with, with the information about when we anticipate will be released. Okay. Are other states doing this? Winding down their programs or extending them? Extending them. I don't know. Yeah, I, I'm not aware of any, but. Yeah. Deal. Yeah, sure. So the majority of the states who had programs, Oregon and others, wound down their programs over a year ago. Um, we've looked across the country. We know that New Hampshire um, is another state that has continued their program and they're winding. They did some wind down earlier um, in the spring and they're winding down around the same time period um, that Vermont is. But I think the bigger message there is that the majority of the states who had these programs up and running wound them down a long time ago. Are we getting people from other states in significant numbers? Um, when we have looked, no. Okay. I've, yeah, the answer to this one. Do we have some in the past? Yes, I don't want to equate that no, no one has moved here, but we're not seeing a significant influx of folks from other states. We're not getting a supply and demand influx. Thank you all very much.